For our offertory prayer today, we want to say thank you. Thank you to God for the church and the earth. I have no imagination that it begins and ends on our campus. I'm just grateful we get to be a part. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? If you're at home, please stand with us for this prayer. We count you a part of this place, even if you don't speak Southern. <laughs> if you listen to enough sermons, you'll learn to say, y'all. You'll know why a possum in the middle of the road is important. You'll learn all sorts of important things. You better join hands. You better take somebody's hand next to you. This is a community prayer. If you don't know the person, introduce yourself. If they won't talk to you, don't touch them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what we have witnessed you doing in our midst. I thank you for the generous gifts of your people, Father, that help us imagine a new future. And I thank you for an Easter weekend when we have the freedom to gather in public and to open our campus and to welcome people. I praise you, Father, for every person that has heard the gospel, that has opened their hearts to you and made the effort to gather with your people. I pray that what they heard and saw and experienced will take root in their hearts, that you'll watch over it. Lord, I pray for a mighty harvest of lives changed and children with a revelation of Jesus of families strengthened. Lord, I thank you for your church in the earth, that Jesus is the head of the church, and that he's neither threatened nor intimidated by expressions of darkness and evil and wickedness, but he's calling men and women from every nation, race, language, and tribe to take their place in his eternal purposes. And Lord, we stand together this morning, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, to say, here we are. Lord, willing to take our place in this community and wherever you've called us from. Lord, for those that are joining us across the nation and around the world, may we stand together in such a way that the name of Jesus is exalted and your kingdom is extended. May your truth in us grow. Give us the wisdom to know how to speak and when to pray, the boldness not to hide. Protect us from every attack of the enemy. I thank you for your faithfulness and for the victories that are yet ahead. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. Give the Lord a hand. He deserves it. You should have received an outline when you came in. It will help. It has most of our scriptures. If you're joining us online or digitally, you can download that from the app or the website. It will help you follow. In our previous session, I, I began a new series talking about when God is moving, because I believe God is moving in the earth. I think it's inappropriate simply to look at the darkness or the evil or the, the multiplication of immorality or all the things that so easily trouble us and to not understand that God is moving in a more profound way than anything in the darkness, uh, because he truly is. And we're going to explore that a bit. We're going to use some biblical characters to try to help us understand. My goal is that we would be prepared to participate with God. And in order to participate, we have to be aware of that he's moving, understand how to recognize that he's moving, allow the scripture which gives us this revelation of the character and nature of God to prepare us to know, oh, that is God. Because typically, I think what we would like to do, if we could just draw it up ourselves, and we can't, is we would like to maintain the routine that we have had and then see God do such extraordinary things to change the world in which we live that we could come and give him a polite round of applause. But my understanding of Scripture is that is not the pattern through which God brings change. He uses people. Isn't that awkward? He uses people like us in all of our brokenness and weirdness and all that we are not. God uses people. So if, if we need a different outcome, we have to be willing to become a part of that transformation. In this session, I want to talk to you about men, women, and angels, because all of them give expression to the will of God in the earth. God won't do through the angels what he intends for men and women to do. And there are things that he's called men and women to do that he won't do with the angels. So I, I think we need to understand our roles and the interplay amongst those things, all of them a part of this, this larger portrayal of God moving in the earth. 
In the, in the plainest of language, I would submit that we're witnessing a generational move of God and that he's doing something today that in scope and scale is beyond anything I have seen in my lifetime. And I believe I could support that in many ways. He's stirring his people throughout the earth. It's not just something in Middle Tennessee. It's not a southern thing. It's not about red states or blue states. There is a group of people responding to God in atypical ways, ways that are not normal. They're willing to disrupt schedules, routines, familiar patterns, to forge new friendships, to step outside of old friendships, to create expressions of faith. I witness on a weekly basis, in the broadest way I have ever seen, a holy dissatisfaction with the status quo. The Spirit of God is stirring people to responses. Now, I can say all of those things. I'm quite confident in that set of statements. I would be willing to share them in just about any setting. But I would follow that by saying the outcomes of what's happening are not as clear to me. My most honest analysis at this moment is that it seems judgment is emerging. I don't believe we should be surprised. We cannot continue with the patterns and trends that we've embraced for quite some season now and imagine that God wouldn't intervene. We are also, as much as we're witnesses to this remarkable move of God, we are also witnessing some rather brazen, unprecedented expressions of the spirit of Antichrist. Again, we shouldn't be surprised. The Bible tells us those will grow as we move towards the, the culmination of this age. But to see it as close to us, it's one thing if it happened on the other side of the globe and mixed the pagan nations of the world, but we live in a nation that is defined as a Christian nation. That you need to, that, that's a malign statement these days, but it, it is an accurate reflection of who we are as a people. We're a nation of immigrants. We've come from the nations of the world. We weren't bound together by the color of our skin or a unique ethnicity or a language or a lengthy history. We were, to a large extent, either fleeing or being driven from the nations of the world. What bound us together was a worldview a Judeo-Christian, a biblical worldview. It underscored our legal system, our founding documents, our educational system. That's just a matter of historical record. Now, we've never been a uniquely Christian nation where that everybody here identified as a Christian or went to church. We've never been an exclusively Christian nation where you had to be a Christian or go to church to live here. In fact, our, our founders very wisely gave us a freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. That's a perversion but a freedom of religion. So when I say we've been a Christian nation, it's that that worldview is what bound us together. We've always been an amazingly diverse group of people. Think of what you know, because you, 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 need, you need to have this tucked away in your heart because there's so much manipulation. If we talk about Iran today, it is a Muslim nation. Now everybody that lives in Iran probably doesn't choose to worship Allah. But you'd be foolish to say Iran is not a Muslim nation. China is a communist nation. I don't imagine that every person in China is an advocate of the Communist Party. But it is factual to say that China is a communist nation. I mean, we can take that. Israel is a Jewish nation. A widely divergent place in terms of opinion and faith and practice. But it is predominantly a Jewish nation. There are some Israeli citizens who aren't Jewish. There's, all, there's a million or so who are Arab and Muslim, but it is nevertheless a Jewish nation. So when I say we're a Christian nation, that's the worldview that has held us together. So what we're watching is really startling when we watch a Christian nation dismantling our heritage. It would be as bizarre as watching Iran dismantle their commitments to Islam, or China dismantle their commitments to communism, or Israel dismantle their commitments to the security of the Jewish people. What you are watching is not just bizarre. It is a reversal of the fabric of who we have been as a people. And there are many expressions of that, and it's happening from the most powerful levels of our society, both politically, culturally, economically. The political leadership in our nation is purposefully expressing disrespect for our biblical worldview, our heritage. They're not just picking on the current generation of people who sit in church. They are taking our heritage as a nation and calling it vile. 
Imagine if they did that to the Native American population. There'd be riots. The declaration on Easter Sunday of a transparency day for the LGBTQ community, the most important day on the Christian calendar, was a very purposeful expression of antagonism and hatred. I don't believe it should be understood any other way. It'd be like going to Israel on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and having National Park Day. It would be purposefully, intentionally disrespectful to the values of the people in that place. And then for the most part, we yawned. There's an expression that's used frequently, you've heard it, that actions speak louder than words. Well, that phrase should inform our responses and it should give every Christ follower pause. In recent months and years, I don't talk about ancient history, I mean in time that we could all discuss every one of us, we have been declared non-essential by our own government. Our beliefs are increasingly classified as hate speech. Laws are implemented which oppose our most fundamental values. Parents, family was God's idea. He defined it. He didn't invent governments to vote on that. Parents are threatened with the removal of their children if they fail to comply with state-dictated behaviors. You can go beyond our local scenarios and local laws. This morning, I woke up to my phone chirping that Israel, under intense pressure from the United States, that's been being ratcheted up for several days, Israel is withdrawing their ground troops from southern Gaza. They're leaving just a, a very light presence. They're reporting in the media that targeted raids are a more effective way to fight Hamas. They're bowing to international pressure, and let's not really hide behind international pressure. They're bowing to pressure from the United States. It should concern us. I was in Washington, D.C. not long ago at the Israeli embassy. I saw the footage of what happened on October 7th. There is no defense of Hamas. There is no defense of Hamas. There is no moral equivalency for what they did. If they are allowed to survive, if they are allowed to flourish, if their leadership stays in place, there will be the further loss, not only of Jewish lives, they, they will bring those same heinous behaviors to us. And yet we watch these daily demonstrations on behalf of Hamas. We see them expressed in the halls of Congress, in front of the most celebrated academic institutions in our nation. And the church doesn't want to talk about it. There are some things that God has said will bring a response from him uniquely. And one of them is forcing solutions on the Jewish people in the nation of Israel that he doesn't intend. And whether you pray for our current administration or not, I would strongly encourage you to begin to ask God to put voices in the, in the administration, whichever, whether you voted for them or you didn't, that would not bring the judgment of God upon us more completely. The British Empire in World War II, and I'll do my lesson, I promise. What time is it? Yeah, we're good. Next service in here is Wednesday. Yeah, right. Even my mom would not clap for that, so you shouldn't even. <laughs> when World War II began, the British Empire boasted that the sun never set on the empire. They were the most powerful empire in the world at that time. There's many ways of understanding this, but I have friends that are British, and the analysis they have shared with me is through the course of that war, and particularly as it came to a conclusion, they betrayed commitments they had made to the Jewish people. They gave every advantage to the Arab League and those. And as a result of that, they won the war and they lost their empire. And they were relegated not to a completely irrelevant point in the global constellation, but one of great, much less significance. I, I have no doubt we will experience the same thing if we continue on the path that we've been pursuing. I don't know that it means our destruction, but I know it means our diminishment. 
We cannot intentionally practice disobedience to the one who caused us to be blessed and to prosper and imagine there are no consequences. So when we talk about God is moving, uh, it's not something theoretical to me. If we are thinking of our future and our children or our grandchildren or the generations who will follow us, we shouldn't just presumptively think everything goes on as it always has. That's a very arrogant attitude. And it requires a stunning ignorance of history to believe it. We're living in a season of unparalleled, unprecedented change in both the scope, the magnitude of the change, and the speed at which it's unfolding. And it represents enormous potential for good. We are able to communicate with more, more people more easily, more broadly, more frequently than any time in human history. It also means messaging can be evil or it can honor the Lord. So if God is moving, the question for God's people is, are we willing to move with him? Are we going to cry because we preferred the brick pits of Egypt? They were predictable and we knew what they were. It's a challenge in the hearts of every one of us. Thus, this little series, in a previous session, you can watch it online if you've missed it. We began, I'm using Gideon really as kind of the, the template for this little study, at least as the beginning point. And in Judges chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's not in your notes, but it is in the Bible. Those notes that you have are a derivative. They've been taken out of that big book. It looks a lot like this one. I hope you read yours. In 6.1 in Judges, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. In the plainest possible language, God withdrew his protection from his covenant people. They're still his covenant people. They're still living in a land that he's given to them. He still identifies with them. They're still offering daily sacrifices. They're still doing, keeping holidays, but God has withdrawn his protection. It's worth noting that we live with the protection of Almighty God, but it is not disconnected from our behavior. We've become so intoxicated with the messages of grace, and I believe in grace. I'm a poster of grace, but it's not the only aspect of God's character we should know. If God would withdraw his protection from his covenant people at other points in time, I, th I know it's safe to assume he could withdraw his protection from us. I know the scripture says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He didn't forsake the people of Gideon's day. He raised up a leader to help deliver them from the Midianites. But for seven years, he removed their protection and they suffered greatly. They were economically devastated. They were humiliated. They were, lives were completely disrupted. And they began to cry out to the Lord and say, God, won't you move on our behalf? We need a fuller understanding of Scripture, not our favorite verses and our pet private theologies that think us God is, cause us to believe God is some sort of a benevolent, heavily dispenser of goodness. While we mock his character. Men, women, and angels, let's go there for just a moment. What do you know about angels? The Bible talks about them a lot. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who inherit salvation? Perhaps the simplest, and it's, it's not by any means a complete definition, but angels are ministering spirits, created beings that God has given assignments to minister in the earth. So I believe angels are active and present on planet earth this morning in the spaces that we occupy. Again, not a complete definition. Daniel chapter 12 gives us a little vision into angels have different roles, different assignments, different expressions of power and authority. They're talked about as being mighty angels or angels that are used as expressions of God's judgment, angels with the power to uh, afflict the earth. Lots of different, it's not just a uniform block. Angel is not any more than saying human. That gives you some general idea, but it, has, it doesn't give you a lot of definition about strength or ability or opportunity or assignment. Angel is equally generic, but in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel has a visit from Michael, the great prince. He's one of the archangels who protects your people. Michael is the archangel assigned to watch over the Jewish people. 
Do you have the imagination that God has assigned angels with specific places and people groups in the world? See, we're far more inclined to believe that about the kingdom of darkness, that there are principalities and powers, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies that have assignments for regions of planet Earth. Well, what you should know is the Bible seems to suggest to us that Satan modeled his kingdom of darkness after the kingdom of God that he had participated in before his rebellion. So when we talk about angels, we're talking about spiritual forces, spiritual beings that God has created that they play a, a role in some very specific assignments to help facilitate deliverance. They're agents of God's judgment. They're a part of our lives. Now, I tell you that because if you can imagine that angels have specific roles and specific assignments, when we talk about men and women, it would be completely illogical to think, oh, we have no assignment other than to get saved and just go to heaven. If God created the angels to be engaged in human history, to let his purposes be done. Remember what Jesus taught us to pray, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then I'm going to submit to you that men and women have assignments for the purposes of the kingdom of God. I brought you just a sample. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, God placed all things under his feet. He's speaking of Jesus. And appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Church is the word that's used for the the body of Christ, people from every nation, race, language, and tribe that have acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah and accepted him as Lord. Those are your credentials to be included in the church. It's not about denomination or building or Sunday morning location. He's placed all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The New Testament refers to the people of God as the body of Christ, an expression of his authority in the earth. Jesus said this in very plain language. He said, in my name, you can ask for whatever you need. Our prayers are concluded in the name of Jesus, not some numb adherence to a formulaic prayer, but rather understanding the authority in which we can approach the throne of God is not our own or our congregations nor our denominations. We approach Almighty God in the name of His Son, Jesus. And we are treated as if we were a part of His family because our affiliation with Him. Don't deny Jesus. No matter what the pressure is, no matter what the threat is, your status and standing in the eternal kingdom of God has everything to do with your willingness to acknowledge Jesus. So whomever or whatever is asking you to deny, diminish, separate from him, understand that is not a good thing. And walk towards those consequences. You want to be identified with Jesus. Romans 5 and verse 10 says, if when we were God's enemies, do you know it's possible to be an enemy of God? If you'll allow me, I would submit to you it is a very serious circumstance to find yourself in an adversarial relationship with Almighty God. That's not going to turn out well. well. I thought God was all about love. Well, He is a God of love, but He's also a God of justice. He's also a God who said, vengeance is mine. You don't want to be God's adversary. You're not getting away with it. If you've chosen wickedness and you think you're so powerful or clever or adroit or adept or nimble or whatever you've imagined, that you're going to pull this off, it won't work. Not a threat, just an acknowledgement. Humble yourself. Talk to the Lord. Tell him the truth. Tell him you're sorry. If you're not sorry, tell him you're convicted. I know it's wrong. And I would rather cooperate with you than be disobedient. This is New Testament, folks. This isn't some Old Testament. When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, Jesus' life? 
It was the death of Jesus that made it possible for you and me to be reconciled to God. There was a breach in our relationship. We were not at peace. We were his adversaries. We were his enemies. He was our enemy. It wasn't just that Alan was ungodly. God was un -Alan. And that's a really bad way to live. But through Jesus' willingness to offer himself as a sacrifice, we have been reconciled to God. We can be at peace with him. In fact, he will invite us into his kingdom, not into a church service, not into a moral code, not into a do-good society. You see, we have so diminished Jesus, there's very little difference between a social club, a civic organization, and the church. And we've been so influenced by this in the church. We've been so influenced by this. We think our primary assignment is to do good things. Yes, we have a biblical assignment to care for widows and orphans. I don't want to diminish that. But we have an assignment from Almighty God that no civic club can do. That no expression of benevolence from the government can compensate for. It's the role of the church. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to the government the message of reconciliation. <laughs> he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Michael, the archangel, has an assignment. The church of Jesus Christ in the earth has an assignment. It's a message of reconciliation. You can be reconciled to God. You don't have to be an adversary of God. You don't have to be an enemy of God. The message is not, God is so loving, you don't need to be worried about it. The message is, you can be reconciled to God. He's made a way. Amen. We are the delivery system for that. There is no plan B. There's no alternative. If God is moving in the earth, it's to further the implementation of this plan of reconciliation. Do you intend to help him? Do you intend to use your voice and your time and your energy and your talents? Are you willing to be disrupted? It's an important question. Don't answer quickly. Let me add this to that. If that's the general background, what I can tell you from the larger text of Scripture is that God moves in the earth through people. In every generation, it's necessary because changes come generationally. It only takes three generations to completely lose an idea. My grandfather, when he began his professional life supporting a family, he did it with horses. You needed horses to earn a living. And he had to provide his own team. Imagine if you couldn't earn a living unless you could harness a team of horses. We'd be some hungry folks. <laughs> Do you know how many hundreds and hundreds of years horses were the primary means of land transportation for human beings? So if you ask, could you saddle a horse? Would you know how to ride a horse? They're like, what are you talking about? It's like asking somebody, Do you know how to ride in a car? Yeah, I think I could figure it out. But it only takes three generations until that becomes something quaint. It's a hobby now. Something we watch on television or in the movies, like a phone book or a paper map or a payphone. <laughs> Things from the past that have evaporated in front of our very eyes. So every generation has to make a God choice. Every generation has to accept the assignment to, to deliver the message of reconciliation. You have to be reconciled to God. Parents have to teach it to their children. They have to instruct their grandchildren. This is not a governmental issue. The reason we're in this fine mess we're in, Ali, is we have not been tending to our assignment. In Judges chapter 6, we're back with Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak and watched Oprah. <laughs> Not exactly, it's a location where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Remember God delivered the Israelites, he withdrew their protection and the Midianites are oppressing them. What that means is they were plundering them economically. It'd be the modern day equivalent of they'd hack your accounts and steal all your assets. Then they'd buy your houses. Gee, that sounds like what's happening in the world today. Other governments. 
buying all of our assets. Millions of people pouring across our border and saying they should have what you have built coming illegally. And our government's not doing anything about it. It would almost look as if God had withdrawn his protection. We've lost our minds. And an angel of the Lord comes to see Gideon. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? If the Lord is so tight with us, how do we get in this place? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. God used to help us, but now God doesn't help us. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? I'm sending you. But Gideon said, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I'm the least. And the Lord answered, I'll be with you. And you'll strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon is seemingly an inconsequential person. He's not a military commander. He's under-resourced. He's under-financed. He's under-connected. He's not an influencer. There's nothing about him that commends him as a champion for his people, except God sent an angel with a message. And God said, Gideon, I have decided to use you. And Gideon responds, you have chosen poorly. <laughs> he said, I know some people that might be able to help you, but I would not be on that list. And nevertheless, God persists. In, in the same chapter, verse 23, the Lord said to him, Peace, don't be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. I thought it was worth noting that Gideon's response was to imagine, you know, he's just going to die. He's completely overwhelmed. He's terrified. I think we understand that. We look at the problems, it's easier not to look at them because they're overwhelming. They're beyond us. They're beyond our ability. They're beyond our strength. They're beyond our wisdom. I would tell you that Gideon is not unique, that all of the heroes you and I know from Scripture were either overwhelmed with the challenge or felt inadequate for the task, and they gave expression to that. I gave you some samples. We can't read them all, but Abram, God said he would make from him a mighty nation, that all the people on earth would be blessed through Abram. And in Genesis 15, Abram said, you've given me no children. Hey, God, not to be a pest or anything, but before I left home on this grand adventure on which we have embarked, you promised me that my descendants would be more numerous than the sand on the seashore, and I got no kids. <laughs> Abraham was giving expression to the kind of feelings that you and I understand. I don't feel adequate to this. Moses, God's recruiting him. I mean, we know him as a prince of Egypt, as the greatest leader in the Bible until we get to Jesus. But when God's recruiting Moses, Moses says, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I grew up with Pharaoh. I know Pharaoh. Pharaoh knows me. And we do not exchange Christmas cards. <laughs> Pharaoh has got an arrest warrant out for me, dead or alive. Who am I? Why would you recruit me? Why would you ask me to do that? Do you understand the consequences if I go back there? All that's living Bible, but it's what Moses is giving expression to. We grew up together. We've been competing since we were kids. Yeah, and I got angry, and I killed that Egyptian taskmaster trying to save a Hebrew slave, and even the slaves didn't hide me. Who am I? Who am I? Esther, you know her story. She's a Jewess. But she's become the queen of Persia, modern-day Iran. The Iranians have hated the Jews for a long, long time. And the command is to kill all the Jews in the empire. It's been signed by the king. And the only possible intercession, it seems, is Esther. And so the man who reared her sends her a note and says, you've got to do something. And Esther says, wait a minute. If I go to the king uninvited, and he's not in a good mood when he sees me, I'll be executed. There's a cost to standing up for what I believe. And so it goes all through the Bible. 
We're either unwilling, we're unaware, we're underinformed. In Matthew 26, Jesus is getting his disciples ready for his betrayal, and he said, you're, you're all going to deny me. And Peter speaks up. He tends to speak up before the rest. Don't you know they loved him for that? <laughs> and Peter said, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Don't you know that made him a fan favorite in the room? <laughs> Lord, I agree with you. The rest of these guys seem a little inconsistent. I'm not too certain about their courage, but I will never back up. Can you see the eye rolls? And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter's undeterred. Yeah, Jesus, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. And then Matthew slips in that other little line. All the other disciples were the same. We pick on Peter, but all the disciples at that point, they're up giving high fives. Yeah, we're never backing out on this. We're in until they weren't. When God is moving, you see, we think it's going to be like a parade, a picnic. It'll be easy. We didn't know we'd have to walk 11 miles. We didn't know somebody was going to put us in a room with 23-year-olds. This doesn't feel like God moving. This feels like the devil in the room with me. <laughs> Who put together this plan? If I ever get out of here, doesn't feel like God moving to me. Look at Paul, 1 Timothy 1. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who's given me strength. He considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. He said, I persecuted these people. I was a violent, angry man. Here's the big picture. There are no perfect recruits. Everyone needs redemption. But that should not be confused with license to live in ungodly ways. There's a lot of confusion in contemporary Christendom. You cannot walk in the dark and expect the benefits of walking in the light. You cannot. You can fool the pastor. You can fool a large part of the community of faith. You are not fooling God. The Bible says he isn't mocked. You see, if sin doesn't really matter, if sin really is not that consequential, if there's not really any consequences to it, it's not that big a deal, just kind of say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if sin is not abhorrent, then Jesus' death really wasn't necessary. But if his death was necessary, it means the problem was an enormous, gargantuan. And we don't want to be perpetrators of the problem. So don't laugh at it. Don't encourage it. Don't stand next to it. Don't support it. Don't align yourself with it. Don't bless it. Don't act like you don't notice. Don't participate in it. Now, there's an individual struggle, and I want to close with this because the application is really important. If we don't get this last piece right, it, it leaves us inert. We're frozen. If we, can, if we can understand it and participate with the Spirit of God, we'll be set free to pursue the opportunities of reconciliation that God will put in front of you. So if you've been sleeping, wake up, poke your neighbor if they've been snoring a bit. In Revelation 12, it's not in your notes. We're introduced to a title of Satan. It's consistent with the larger picture of Scripture, but it's stated explicitly when we have this picture of the battle in the heavenlies. And Satan is, is presented to us as the accuser of the brethren. It says in that chapter that he accuses men and women before God nonstop. Well, the first place that his accusations are unveiled are within us. He will remind you of all that you're not. He is a master at reminding you of your failures. Moses at that burning bush, but he was more aware of his failure and the threats of Pharaoh than he was of a bush that was burning. And so we've got to do something with this. You can't just live through your sin. The model that we've embraced in much of contemporary Christendom 
is if, if we go through an episode of ungodliness, we make ungodly choices, we, we make sinful choices, whatever those would be, immorality, you, you, we, can, we can build out the list. We think, okay, that was a bad choice, that was a bad set of circumstances, but I'm just going to live through it. I'm going to outwork it. I'm going to put some time between me and that set of choices. I'm going to make some better choices. And we think we'll just live through our sin. That is not an adequate solution. That's not a biblical solution. The Bible gives us another approach. It says that we can repent and we can be set free. What is, what is presented to us is that our involvement in ungodliness has a residual influence upon us that can't just be lived through. You might look the same on the outside, but there are spiritual repercussions. One of which is you're vulnerable to the accusations of the enemy. So that if you've participated in sexual immorality, abortions, pornography, if you've hidden addictions in your life, we can make a lengthy list. We're all familiar with these because they've touched all of us directly and indirectly, whatever they are. And the approach has just been to live through it and to do better and to learn to overcome that addictive behavior but never really deal with its roots. You see, the good news about Jesus is that you can be free from the kingdom of darkness. You don't just have to live through it. Look at 1 John 1, 6 and 7. It says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and we don't live by the truth. But, but is a negative conjunction and is a positive conjunction. But means we're going to push another idea into this, but we're going to go in the opposite direction. The previous sentence talked about walking in, in the darkness. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now let me jump to the punchline. If we meet those conditions, there's nothing for which you can be accused. So when the devil says to you, oh, no, no, you're not going to be a voice of reconciliation in this family. You can't say to your kids, you shouldn't live that way because you lived worse than that. If you haven't implemented this, you lose all of your momentum, all of your courage to intercede and intervene in that point because in your accusation, you'll capitulate. On the other hand, if we will apply that truth, we can be free. We can be free. Four very plainly stated facts in verse 7. Verses, I'm sorry, verses 6 and 7. One, we cannot choose to walk in darkness and expect God's protection. You cannot. I don't care if you sit in church. I don't care if you're generous. I don't care if you volunteer your time. It's very plainly stated. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie. And you don't live in the truth. So if you're walking in the darkness, and only you know that, before we go today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to choose a new path. But there's three more statements that are equally important. In verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light, you have to choose to walk in the light. And thirdly, if we have fellowship with one another. If you're doing those things, then the blood of Jesus will purify you from all sin. I'll give you one more component. It's helpful. It's not really apparent in English. It's, it's more, the, the Greek language is more highly inflected. It's a more specific language than certainly modern-day English is. And the verb tenses in that passage are in the continuing present tense. I didn't learn that in English class either. I learned that in Greek class when I had to learn the Greek verb tense, which means that the implication, what's being stated, is that if we walk in the light and we continue to walk in the light, and if we have fellowship with one another and we continue to fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us and purifies us from all sin. Hallelujah. So the invitation is to not walk in the darkness, but to continue to walk in the light. We're on a journey. It wasn't a stop we made at an altar. 
It was a decision to lead our lives walking in the light. And if we have deviated from that path and we've taken a dark path, we have to repent and humble ourselves, acknowledge our ungodliness, and come back and say, I will walk in the light. If we have fellowship with one another, folks, this meeting together thing is not simply about a tote board where we count numbers. The, the participation numbers in Easter are only significant to me in evaluating our effectiveness in being ministers of reconciliation. If we want to change the top end of that number, I'll tell you what has to happen. We have to engage more people in serving. I'm not going to get more or less annoyed. Anointed. This is kind of what you get. <laughs> but if together we say this matters more to us, we'll invest time and energy and effort and we'll be a part and we'll, we'll park a car or stand with a baby or whatever we need to do. We want people to be reconciled to God. If we continue to have fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us. Why does that matter? Because when, when you're presented with one of those opportunities, the devil will roll in and say, just who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to say that you're pro-life and you have participated in abortions? Who do you think you are, you hypocrite? Who do you think you are to talk to your children or a coworker or a friend about making biblically moral choices when you've practiced immorality for a lengthy season in your life. Who do you think you are? And the list can go on and on and on. And many, many of us have been silenced or crippled. Many of us have been in relationships with people who know of our failures. Some of them have suffered because of our ungodliness. And even though we have repented and, and come back and tried to initiate restoration, we haven't extended forgiveness. We use it as leverage. And whether you're conscious of it or not, if you're using other people's ungodliness as leverage to gain an advantage, you're not walking in the light and you're forfeiting the protection and the opportunity you could have. You see, you have, may have suffered because of the sins of other people. That's a part of the human condition. But you can't hold resentment and bitterness and hatred. You can't gain an advantage because of others' sins. We have to forgive them. Do you understand how much effort is being sown in our culture right now to create anger and division and resentment and bitterness and hatred? It's removing God's protection and blessing from us. So what the Bible says is we have to forgive. We mistakenly think that when we forgive, somebody gets away with it. Oh, no, no, no. God is just. You don't have to. When you forgive, you are set free. You are set free. If we walk in the light, if we continue in the light as he's in the light, if we continue in fellowship with one another, because that's where all the bumps get. You know, church is such a peaceful place when there's nobody here. I can walk through this building and I love everybody here. <laughs> I hardly ever get annoyed. It's just a special, special place. And then they unlock the doors. <laughs> and the quality of peace gets a little spotty because we're an unlikely lot. If we will walk in the light, and walk in fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us. And we can pick up our assignment to be ministers of reconciliation. Not because we're perfect. We were just like Paul. Some of us were angry and violent. Some of us were like Peter and the disciples. We've denied the Lord. Oh, we've shut down our Jesus stories because we were in places where they didn't make us popular, so we acted like we didn't know him. Some of us have been like Esther. We thought the price was too high, so we said, no, I think I'm just going to pass on this one. It's okay. Some of us have been like Gideon and said, God, you've got to be kidding. I'm not saying anything. Let somebody better equipped say something. You can find yourself all over the Bible. But God. God is moving, folks. Let's move with him. So I brought you a prayer. It'd be wrong to talk about this and not intentionally take some steps towards freedom. Some of you need to forgive. 
You have reconciled. You have re-engaged a relationship. You have, have been willing to go forward, but in your heart, there has been anger and resentment. There's been a sense of superiority because you weren't the one who did whatever. You didn't transgress. Some of us, because of our failures, we've lived through them, but we're still living with them. And it has silenced you. You see, we've been silent for so long about so much immorality in the church. We've winked at premarital sex and extramarital sex and all sorts of immorality that now we find ourselves where we can't even find the voice to say, we don't think transgender participation in sports would be the best thing for our small children. We didn't arrive at this place in a day or a week. We've been ignoring God's moral boundaries for so long. And we haven't gone back to these passages to be clean. So today, let's decide to take a step towards the Lord. I brought you a prayer, but I want, to understand, I want you to understand the parts where you can engage. Let the, the, the Holy Spirit lead you beyond this first prayer of this. If he brings persons to mind or circumstances to mind, either where you need to forgive someone else or you need to be forgiven, get this prayer back out and pray it again. Let the Holy Spirit lead you, but stop acting like it's inconsequential. When you do that, what you say is all this story and drama around Jesus' death is not that big a deal. Do you understand how awkward that will be when you see Jesus? Let's stand together. We'll pray this together. But I really want to send it with you. You ready? You can pray with us at home, just like you're on in the house. Heavenly Father, I rejoice that through the blood of Jesus, I have been delivered out of the hand of the devil. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, continually cleanses me from all sin. In humility, I acknowledge my need of forgiveness and my need to forgive others. I release all of those who have wronged me, harmed me, or caused me pain. I entrust them to your care. I thank you now that I am free. I have been reconciled to God, set free to fulfill God's purposes for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.